On the afternoon of February 11, 2011, David Rosler, a 26-year-old undergraduate student, decided to explore the Stay High Cave in Virginia along with one of his friends. The cave, aptly named, required cavers to stay high at the entrance. The name Stay High Cave comes from the critical strategy required to navigate its tricky entrance. As cavers approach the entrance, the cave floor quickly narrows into a tight V-shaped passage that slopes downward. To avoid becoming trapped, cavers must stay high by keeping their bodies elevated on the upper, wider part of the passage. This means they need to be careful with their movements and maintain a high position as they enter, using the walls for support rather than allowing themselves to slide downward into the narrowing gap. If they fail to stay high, they can easily get into trouble, as David Rosler did in the story. David, knowing the risks and that he has no such experience in caving, went in to explore the cave all by himself. As he tried to keep himself at the wider section of the cave, he misjudged his position. While navigating himself through the passage, unknowingly, he inched closer to the narrowest part of the V-shaped passage. The cave started to close in on him, and before he could realize his grave mistake, he felt the ground give way beneath him, and suddenly, he was sliding downwards at a terrifying speed. Panic surged through him as he desperately tried to regain control, but the slick walls offered no grip. In a mere second, he was dragged into the narrowest part of the passage where the cave walls converged like a vice. His body wedged tightly between the unforgiving rock. David struggled to move, but every attempt only made the pressure more unbearable. He tried to push himself up to twist free but the cave held him in a merciless grip. The more he fought, the more he realized the hopelessness of his situation. As the hours passed, David's initial frustration turned to fear. He struggled to free himself, but every movement only seemed to wedge him tighter. His breathing became labored and panic began to set in as the reality of his situation dawned on him. His friend who was hiking nearby realized David had not returned. As soon as he reached the entrance of the cave, he could hear his friend's cries for help. The Newport Rescue Squad was the first to arrive, responding swiftly to the call. However, despite their best efforts, they were unable to extract David from the narrow passage. The situation was becoming more dire with each passing hour, and reinforcements were called in. The Blacksburg Rescue Squad's confined rescue team and members of Virginia Tech's VPI Cave Club soon joined the effort, bringing with them specialized tools and expertise. By now, the sun had set and the temperature outside had plummeted. Inside the cave, the cold was seeping into David's bones, and hypothermia became a serious concern. Rescuers worked tirelessly, using power tools to carefully chip away at the bedrock surrounding David. Every inch of progress was painstakingly slow, and as they hoisted him up, David would often get stuck again, forcing them to remove more rock. As things became more desperate, Rescuers discussed the option of breaking his hips to maneuver him out. David's pain and fear were overwhelming. His leg was trapped at an awkward angle, and every shift in position sent waves of agony through his body. The crushing pressure on his leg was becoming unbearable, and the cold only intensified his suffering. Rescuers knew they had to keep him warm to prevent hypothermia from taking hold. They stuffed heat packs into his clothing, and at one point, a hairdryer was even used to blow warm air onto his body. Despite their efforts, the wind chill inside the cave dropped into the single digits, and David's condition continued to deteriorate. As the night dragged on, David's strength began to wane. His movements became sluggish, and he started slipping in and out of consciousness. But the rescuers refused to give up. They knew that a stuck caver was in a life or death situation, and they responded with the urgency it demanded. Inch by inch, they continued to lift David, carefully removing the bedrock that held him captive. Finally, shortly after 3 a.m., after nearly 12 hours of grueling effort, David was freed. Rescuers pulled him from the cave, his body limp and exhausted. He was immediately flown to Montgomery Regional Hospital, where he was treated for hypothermia and a severe crush injury to his leg. The doctors worked to stabilize him, but the trauma of the night had taken its toll. In this story, the people involved did not allow their names to be published. On 24th January 2011, 
Four young adults from the Johns Hopkins Outdoor Club, two men and two women, decided to explore Chetromf Cave. Their goal was to assess its potential for future club outings. They entered the cave around 2.30 p.m., excitement buzzing among them as they navigated the dark, twisting passages. The exploration went well until tragedy struck. As they began their exit, one of the young men found himself facing a particularly tight and challenging section of the cave. To get out, he had to go head first through a narrow, hourglass-shaped passage. This passage then made a sharp 90-degree turn before narrowing even further into a body-sized wormhole, ominously known as the corkscrew. With a mix of determination and caution, he approached the narrow passage on his hands and knees. But as he lowered himself into the pit head first, he misjudged his grip. Before he could adjust, his left leg folded against his chest in a painful, fetal-like position. The unforgiving rock walls pinched around him, trapping him at the tightest part of the hourglass, completely upside down with his head resting on the cold, hard ground. Panic set in quickly. His female companions, though brave and determined, were unable to pull him free. They tried to lift him, but their strength wasn't enough, and they couldn't get the right leverage. After 20 agonizing minutes, they realized they needed help. One of them scrambled out of the cave and called 911. Trapped upside down in the narrow, suffocating passage, the young man felt the relentless pressure of the rock walls squeezing his chest and compressing his limbs. His left leg, twisted painfully against his torso, throbbed with a dull, relentless ache. But it was the sensation in his head that truly terrified him. Blood pooled and rushed to his skull creating an unbearable pressure that made his vision blur and his thoughts swim. The pounding in his head was like a hammer striking from within, each beat of his heart sending a fresh wave of excruciating pain through his temples. He could feel the blood vessels straining, as if they were on the verge of bursting, while a fiery, searing pain radiated from his neck down his spine. As the rescue was initiated, a local resident heard the call over a scanner and immediately contacted his friend, Jerry Bowen, an experienced caver. Jerry and his son, Stephen, quickly drove to the site, their minds racing with the possibilities of what they might face. On arrival, they met with the deputy fire chief of the Mogginsville Goodwill Volunteer Fire Department. Despite neither Jerry nor Stephen having been inside Shetromf Cave before, the fire chief was convinced they could help. No one else on the scene was small enough to reach the trapped caver. Stephen, being the smaller of the two, was chosen to go in. He was equipped with water, hearing protection, eye protection, an air quality meter, a compressed air tank, and an air chisel. One of the women, who had emerged with a camera to show the trapped man's predicament, volunteered to guide Stephen back into the cave, carrying supplies. When Stephen finally reached the trapped caver, they found themselves face to face. The man was lodged so tightly that Stephen couldn't get past him. He handed the bag of supplies to one of the man's friends, who carefully offered the trapped caver some water. Stephen then went back for the air tank. Once back, Stephen began chiseling away at the rock, his heart pounding as he tried not to injure the trapped man. The work was slow and nerve-wracking. At one point, they had to call for a steel plate to shield the man from the chisel. When Stephen returned with the plate and a fresh tank, he found the situation had worsened. The trapped caver had slipped further down, making it even harder to access the rock. But Stephen wasn't ready to give up. With the man's friend pulling from above and Stephen pushing from below, they managed to get him into a slightly better position. Stephen resumed chiseling, carefully removing the final rock projection. With a collective push and pull, the man's leg finally popped free of the constriction. The moment the radio crackled with the news of his release, a wave of relief washed over everyone. The freed caver, exhausted and shaken, drank some water and rested briefly before beginning the slow, painful journey back to the entrance. As they neared the exit, two confined space rescue professionals met them to assist with a 15-foot climb. He was flown to a hospital for evaluation, but miraculously, he had no serious injuries. Howard's Waterfall Cave is a great place to visit, but it has a dark history. One chamber, known as the Disaster Room, got its name from a terrible event on April 16, 1966, which we will discuss right now. 
buried in the thick limestone of Georgia, are at least 513 caves. These caves were formed by acidic groundwater that has slowly trickled through cracks in the rock. Some of these caves are quite challenging to explore. Boy Scout Explorer Post 76 had formed a few weeks before this date of tragedy. On that Saturday morning, they gathered in Atlanta to go on their second outing. They had gone on a bike ride the week before, but this time, they were ready for a real adventure. All nine boys had caved before, so a trip to Howard's Waterfall Cave seemed like a perfect challenge. At 6 a.m., the boys met at the community center, where their leader, Phil Howe, and his assistant, Mike Moss, were waiting. Phil was an experienced caver and made sure the boys were dressed warmly, had plenty of food and more water than they needed. The night before, one of the boys joked with his mom that they had enough water for a week, showing how seriously Phil took the trip. Phil's knowledge of the cave reassured the boys and their parents that everything would be fine. Around 9 to 9.30 a.m., the group arrived and headed into the cave. Since it was spring, the entrance was muddy, but they could stand up, light their carbide lamps, and wash off with the extra water they had brought. In the 60s, carbide lamps were more popular than electric ones because they lasted longer, were cheaper, and were more durable. These lamps worked so well that some cavers continued using them until LED lamps were invented. By 12.30 p.m., they reached a vertical section of the cave, not far from an exit. This section had a 40-foot pit in the big cave area. The drop created a pocket that made it easy to climb, so Mike went to a ledge at the bottom while Phil helped the boys onto a ledge halfway down. The boys climbed down until only four were left with Phil. The rest were at the bottom with Mike. As one boy began to climb down, Mike saw a flame like a jet tail coming from the cave wall or floor. This was followed by an explosive fireball that knocked Mike and the boys down. Their lights went out, and in total darkness, Mike crawled around until he found daylight and a way out. He quickly called for emergency help. Soon, hundreds of spelunkers arrived at the cave. Five rescuers entered immediately to save the trapped scouts. They found six boys and got them out, including one who was severely burned. It seemed his lamp had caused the explosion. An ambulance took him to the hospital where he was treated for third degree burns. Phil was still on the ledge they had reached before the explosion. They were only 20 feet from the cave floor and 300 feet from the entrance, but Phil felt faint whenever he tried to move. As he struggled, the rescuers went deeper into the cave to find the remaining scouts, but the smell of gasoline got worse. They didn't know how the gas got there, but it forced them to turn back. They barely made it to the cave entrance before passing out and had to be pulled out and rushed to the hospital. Sadly, only two of the rescuers survived. The explosion had left a dangerous carbon monoxide pocket between the entrance and the scouts. Rescuers hoped the scouts were in an area with safe air. By 6.30 p.m., lights were set up at the cave entrance as it got dark. Staff Sergeant Leroy Coxwell, a fire protection specialist, contacted the scouts using a breathing apparatus. The scouts were still alive but trapped behind the poisonous gas. Leroy shouted for them to stay calm and assured them help was coming. Stay calm! Stay calm! But it took four hours to get the right equipment. At 10.30 p.m., with new air tanks, Leroy and other rescuers reached the boys, fitted them with masks, and led them through the dark tunnels. When they got out, one rescuer announced that the three remaining boys were safe, but Phil was not with them. Tragically, Phil's attempts to get through the gas had been too much. <coughs> <coughs> and he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. After the rescue, the mystery was what caused the explosion. People initially thought a fungus in the cave caused the gas. Years later, they discovered that a broken tank at a nearby gas station had been leaking gasoline into the ground. The vapor seeped through cracks into the cave's disaster room and was ignited by the carbide lamp, causing the tragic explosion.